Okay. My name is Calvin Mitchell. I am the assistant curator of philately uh, here at the National Postal Museum. And I'd like to say that on behalf of the National Postal Museum, I'd like to thank everyone for attending this event. Um, this uh, event, this is my usual spiel for the program's groupies, but I'll have to say it anyway. Um, this event was brought to us um, through a generous grant from the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Basically, it's uh, to celebrate the opening of the event and to basically spread the cheer about the uh, museum being part of the uh, new Smithsonian family, a new member of the Smithsonian family. And in addition to that, as some of you know, that this is the centennial of the National, of the National Park Service. Um, I want to encourage everyone to visit our, I guess it's closed now, but to visit our uh, exhibition, Trailblazing 100 Years of Our National Parks. Hmm. Oh, it's open. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, you can't go until after the, uh, after the lecture. Um, tonight's lecture will focus on the uh, 6888 Central Postal Directory Battalion. Um, this is an all black, all female unit that was deployed in France and England during World War II. And the purpose of the battalion's deployment was to uh, clear the backlog of of undelivered military mail in the European theater of operations. And tonight our guest lecturer is Dr. Brenda Moore. And she has chronicled the accomplishments of, the win of, the, of these women in a book that's titled, To Serve My Country, To Serve My Race, the story of the only African-American wax stationed overseas during World War II. And immediately after her lecture, we will have a book signing ceremony downstairs, and I urge each and every one of you to purchase a book, as I did. Okay, um, by way of introduction, um, Dr. Moore is currently an associate professor of sociology at the State University of New York at Buffalo. I, I, was, I, I was talking to Dr. Moore about that, I, just such an odd title for school. <laughs> Uh, she holds an MA and a PhD in sociology from the University of Chicago. And Dr. Moore has written extensively on race, women in the military, and social stratification. So everyone, please join me in welcoming Dr. Ben Brenda Moore. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Now, this is going to be a little bit of a juggling game here. Let me just set this. Is this okay to do this? I'm used to spreading out. It's my pleasure. It's my pleasure to be here this evening uh, to give this lecture in honor of the new Smithsonian uh, Museum, African American uh, Museum of History and Culture. Hey. Okay. I would like to thank Mr. Calvin Mitchell and all of his staff members of the Smithsonian uh, National, National Postal Museum for hosting this event and for organizing this event this evening. I must say that it's an honor to be here to speak about the 6888 Central Postal Directory Battalion in the original postal unit this was the original post office of Washington, D.C. I'm excited about being here, and I'm sure that members of the 6888 would be thrilled as well. I will start this evening's uh, lecture. Can everybody hear me okay? I hear an echo. Uh, I will start this evening uh, lecture by saying a few words about the 6888, followed by a PowerPoint presentation and ending with a Q&A. 
Let me just start by saying that the 6888 Central Postal Directory Battalion was the first African American Women's Army Corps unit to serve overseas during World War II. It consisted of 31 officers and more than 700 enlisted women. The battalion was comprised of five companies. I must also mention that the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps, which later converted to the Women's Army Corps, just making the Women's Army Corps part of the Army, was racially segregated. When the War Department requisitioned women in the Army Corps to serve overseas, African American women were initially excluded. Black congressional representatives, the NAACP, the National Council of Negro Women, founded by Mary McLeod Bethune, and other African American activists launched a campaign that pressured the War Department to include African American women in all of women's Army Corps activities. So I say that to say that the 6888 came about as a result of political struggle. Now while collecting data for my study, I spent a lot of time examining archival documents. For example, I collected archival documents on African Americans and on women who served during World War II from the National Archives. And I say it like that because of the fact that there's a whole file in the archives on African Americans, usually African American men, and then there's a whole file in the military on women, usually white women serving in the time. In order to do a, st a study looking at African American women, you've got to look at what's going on with African Americans and what's going on with women. So I had to look at two sets of files. I also met and had multiple conversations with 51 members of the 6888 from 1990 to 1995. And I continue to speak with them in subsequent years. I traveled to every region of the United States to meet with the women. I attended one of the Women's Army Corps reunions, and this reunion was held at Fort McClellan, Alabama at the time in 1990. I also attended two of the Black WACs, it was called the Black WAC, uh, organization, and I attended two of their reunions, one in Florida, the other in San Francisco. However, most of the interviews took place in their homes. And if I could not travel to their homes, to the house, to the interviews, then I spoke with them by telephone. So at the time that these women served in the 6888, they were in their late teens or their early 20s. They were diverse in socioeconomic background, their education, their interests, their talents. For example, Charity Adams Early, who was the commanding officer, was from South Carolina. She was in graduate school when she was invited to be part of that first officer candidate school for um, women in the Women's Army Corps. Uh, Noel Campbell Mitchell was from Tuskegee, Alabama. She had a brother who was part of the Tuskegee Airmen. Her father ran the, uh, an outreach program for the Department of Agriculture. And she, he was housed in uh, or based at um, Tuskegee Institute. Uh, ba Margaret Barber, on the other hand, lived in an area that was predominantly white, and her father was a farmer. So what I'm saying is that they come from diverse backgrounds. But even though they had different socioeconomic backgrounds, different uh, regional backgrounds, they still all identified with being Americans of African descent. They were taught to be proud of their culture. They were taught to uh, value education, value and respect themselves. 
and to be of service to others. They realized that Negroes were not always treated fairly in America. But what's important is that they were determined not to let that stop them from being the very best they could be. I'll now turn to my PowerPoint. So what I'm saying is that the 6888, or the story about the 6888 Central Postal Directory Battalion is more than just a story about women in the military. It is a narrative about a struggle for racial equality in America. It's a story of social change. What's at the core of this story is citizenship rights. And this is so important for our discussion because of the fact that the military service was an avenue to citizenship. Traditionally, military service was both a right and an obligation of citizens. And full citizenship was reserved exclusively for white males. So military service was a pathway to citizenship. White ethnics obtained naturalized citizenship through military service. For an example, World War I, immigrants from South, Eastern, Southern Eastern Europe, um, Germans, Austrians, actually obtained citizen, naturalized citizenship through going into the military. The work of Nancy Gentile Ford tells us that 20% of the US soldiers in the military during World War I were immigrants, representing 46 nationalities. So this whole notion of n citizenship is central to the story of the 6888. One might ask, well, if going to the service means being a citizen or having citizenship rights, then why didn't African Americans during World War II, in the beginning of World War II, have citizenship rights? Well, the point is, and the fact is, that prior to World War II, racism actually obstructed citizenship rights for African Americans. Well, one would say, well, if they were not citizens because of their race, well maybe they should have gone into the service. Going through service would make you a citizen. Well, the fact is that African Americans served in all wars. Nearly 5,000 fought on the side of the colonists during the American Revolution. Some 390,000 fought for the Union Army during the Civil War. The 9th and 10th Cavalry and the 24th and 25th Infantries bore arms and fought gallantly in the Spanish-American War. The 92nd Infantry Division was created during World War I. But still, at the beginning of World War II, African-Americans were not given citizen, full citizenship rights. And so, as a sociologist, I would ask, why not? What's going on? How do I explain it? And what I find very helpful in the explanation of what was going on prior to World War II, and in some cases today, but not nearly as much as what was going on uh, prior to World War II, I turn to theories to try to explain this. And I say theories because of the fact that theories of race relations will help to explain race relations of the day. And theories of race relations also help to shape race relations of the day. There was this recruit reject syndrome going on pertaining, whenever it pertained to 
uh, African Americans and women for that matter. During war, African Americans were recruited for military service. After war, their services and their earned benefits as veterans were rejected. And so there was this constant reminder of second class citizen. Now, many of you probably know this whole thing with citizenship, and it's important to talk about the theories that I'm going to introduce in a minute because of the fact that African Americans were already citizens, technically speaking. The 13th Amendment did what? It abandoned slavery, it got rid of, abolished slavery, got rid of slavery. The 14th Amendment made African American citizens. Anyone born in the United States or naturalized citizens were citizens. The 15th Amendment did what? We're talking about in 1865, 1866, 1867, 1868. The 15th Amendment gave African American males at that time, because females didn't have the right, gave African Americans males the right to vote. So actually, technically, African American men had the right to vote before white women. All right, so it was already there in legislation, it's in the Constitution, but still, African Americans did not have full citizenship rights. You had the segregation going on. So my question as a sociologist is how is racism justified in a nation with democratic ideals? There seems to be a fundamental contradiction there. And the theories I turn to, and I look at theories of race relations, you can't probably see the first part very well. That first theory up here is cultural theories. The second theory I, I have here is biological explanation or um, uh, the Darwinist theories. Hmm. Okay. Here we go. And then this, I should not put my finger there. I don't, my pointer doesn't work. And then that last theory is structural inequality theories. All of these theories were existing at one time. All of these theories were competing. And what they tell us is that when you look at cultural theories, these theories were used to explain how white ethnics were going to be come citizens in the United States. How are you going to integrate white, white uh, ethnics? People like Parks and um, Gunner, uh, Gunner, Myrtle Gunner would say that you can use these cultural theories and extend them to African Americans, and this would be a way of integrating African Americans. That was one competing theme during that time. But the theme that really took on and dominated, and I say it dominated because it reflected in all of the institutions and the laws and the policies, was that of biological or genetic inferiority. Herbert Spencer is where this is rooted, 1820 to 1903, his work on social evolution, which was required reading when I was in grad school. And the emphasis here is on adaptation of the human being to the environment. Many of you have probably seen this uh, same sort of idea represented in what is called social Darwinism, uh, survival of the fittest, biologistic theory. Well, racial discrimination in the United States, I would say, was based on the false premise that African Americans were genetically inferior to whites. It was a belief that permeated U.S. institutions and was a belief that was shaped by biologistic theories. Again, by contrast, early ethnicity-based theories concentrated on the problems of European immigrants and cultural contact. Works of Robert Parks, Thomas and Zanaki's work on Polish immigrants look to ethnicity or cultural base. All we have to do is educate them, socialize them into the American way of doing things. You probably heard the term Americanization and 
these folks would become good Americans. It didn't work that way for African Americans. Now, it wasn't just a race factor when we talk about the 6888. Again, there was a case of women. There was an ideology that was very prevalent during that time of paternalism. And this obstructed citizenship's rights for women. U.S. viewed women as being less capable than men and in need of protection. Uh, consequently, the subject of using women in the military sparked many heated debates. At the intersection of race and gender, you find the 6888. They're battling both this. They're battling race stereotypes and they're battling gender stereotypes. World War II is so important when we're talking about race and gender in this context because World War II marked a turning point. First, there wasn't enough white males. Occupational positions were vacated by white males who were sent abroad to fight. There was a need for racial minorities and women to fill those positions and minorities and women actively participated in roles that had been previously closed to them. So we're beginning to see a change here. A fundamental contradiction that existed is that the nature of the conflict, what was the conflict about? All the women would say, we weren't going to let Hitler rule the world. It was against fascism, Nazism, totalitarianism. Well, if you're going to go and send people to abroad to fight for fascism, to, to get rid of that and totalitarianism, and to protect the world for democracy, you've got to have democracy at home. That's the fundamental contradiction, and that's why I say World War II marks a, um, a, um, a turning point. Racism, ethnic antagonism, and gender inequality were under heavy scrutiny. So you have the Selective Service Act of 1940. This lists racial restrictions. African American men were recruited for the war in greater numbers than previous years. They also served in a greater variety of military assignments. African Americans also were to serve in racially segregated units. Military doors during this time period open to women. The establishment of the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps, May 1942, converted to the WACs in 1943. Waves, 1942, Marine Corps, 1943. There was a campaign to make sure that when the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps was established that African American women would be a part of it. And so there were leaders, African American leaders, that were campaigning for African American women to be part of that officer corps, for African American women to be enlisted into the armed force. It wasn't uncommon, I should say, for African American women to go down to a recruiting station and try to enlist and be turned away. And so uh, the archives are replete with letters that were written in contest of that, contesting the fact that African American women were not being allowed in. And so it was a constant struggle. Among those leaders was Mary McLeod Bethune. Women, African American women were allowed into the um, Women's Army Corps, and when they were, like their male counterparts, they were to serve in segregated, racially segregated units. Like their male, male counterparts, they also challenged racial segregation. So a theme that emerges in all of the interviews that I did was racial segregation. Now, in terms of the demonstrations against and the protesting of um, the segregated military, the segregated wax, there's a lot of newspaper articles of the time. And just for an example here, you see ne uh, Negro, it says Negro wax at air base. 
turn down Negro Wax for overseas service. Well, that first one, Negro Wax at Air Base, actually reflects, that story is about um, African American women who served in the Air Base, and on this Air Base, the uh, commander said that did not want them to um, do things that the white wax were doing. They were only to do, only to do the most dirty jobs. They protested it. They protested it. They were facing a court martial. Uh, and again, leaders on the outside challenged that court martial. And then much later, they were exonerated. But here is a struggle, a struggle that you're not going to always see. It's not going to be played on primetime TV. But when you dig into the archives and find what the relationship was like for these women, yes, they served, they served proudly, but they struggled. Another example of racial segregation and why it was so detested was that you know, some, these women came in, into the military from all over the world, oh, excuse me, all over the country, all different regions. And here in 1945, July of 1945, this newspaper article is about a woman from Syracuse, New York, who was stationed in uh, Kentucky at a, at a train station in Kentucky in uniform and sat in the white only waiting room. She was beaten unmercifully by a white police officer. Her family didn't know, and she was hospitalized. Her family didn't know where she was and that she was hospitalized or what had happened until days later. I think what struck me most about this article when I saw it in the archives was that not only was she in uniform and beaten, but she was being threatened uh, with court-martial by the War Department because she disobeyed the law. It was law that blacks and white be separate. That's why I said it was that biological or biologistic theory that really explains what was going on during that time during um, uh, when we're talking about race relations. What's interesting here, I want to give you an example that while this is going on in the military with the women in uniform, you've got people like Mary McLeod, McLeod, uh, McLeod Bethune writing letters. Here's a letter. This is just a portion of a letter that she wrote to one of her donors. And the campaign would be fundraising as well to assist with the, um, uh, uh, the legal fees and what have you for women who were being brought to charge. Um, it says, my dear Dr. Brown, please accept our thanks for your contributions of $5 to help investigate the court-martial of the four Negro members of the Women's Army Corps at Fort Devens. They were the ones who were going to be court-martialed. It says, as you know, the soldiers have been exonerated now, this is interesting, and this is why I put this in here. I skipped part of the letter, but it says, but this does not mean that our work is done. We are now investigating Colonel Crandall, who ordered the court-martial. So here, this campaign is going forward. Yes, we're going to make sure these women are, as to our best of ability, are exonerated for disobeying this, this terrible order, but we're also going to investigate this uh, commander for even giving the order to begin with. Uh, sincerely yours, Mary McLeod Bethune, President. One other thing that I ought to mention is that unlike African-American males who served in segregated units, African-American women who served in segregated units were commanded by African-American women. So there were uh, African-American women officers like uh, Charity Adams early, um, when she was Chatty, Charity Adams at that time, um, uh, Bernice Campbell, uh, the 31 served with this unit. So the segregated unit Afri of the wax were commanded by, by um, African American um, women. The um, battalion commander of the 6 
attended the officer candidate training candidate for women, the very first one that was established. I have a little clip here, and I think that this little clip actually shows and summarizes everything that I've been saying so far in terms of what was on the minds of these women, the fact that these women were very proud, and I thought it'd be nice to be able to hear this summarized by the voice and the, uh, looking at this video that was done at the WAC Museum uh, in 1990. This is just a very small clip, about five minutes, but um, I think that it really illustrates the point. Now. <laughs> I'm not getting my cue. Sorry about that, it's not coming through. Then I'm going to have to go on to plan B here. Um, oh, here it is. Mm -hmm. My, our tech people promised me this would work. We even went over it before. Right, let's try this again. Here today to talk about the service as a member of the Women's Army Corps, which she experienced during the Second World War, is Mrs. Charity Adams Early, who is a most distinguished soldier, an educator, a wife, a mother and a much honored citizen of Dayton, Ohio. This is early good afternoon. Thank you. Good afternoon to you. Let's go back to the beginning. Okay. When you made that big decision to enlist in the United States Army, that was back in 1942, wasn't That's it? That's right. And could you tell me where you were at that time, what you were doing at that time, and what made you decide to enlist? I was living in Columbia, South Carolina, where I had grown up. I'd finished college, and I was teaching in the public schools there. And as you will know, that in 1942, this country had segregation and discrimination against yes. minorities. And uh, when the opportunity came with, for me to try something else, I decided to do it. Teaching was about the only thing available for you unless you went into domestic service in that part of the country. So I was rather, I, I guess the Army was recommended to me and I was recommended to it, as were most of us who were in the first officer candidate class, and I decided to take it. I understand one of your deans at Wilberforce University yes. had recommended you. Uh, dean, uh, dean Teal, the Dean of Women, had recommended me and several other women from our, uh, who graduated from Wilberforce. Not all of them chose to investigate this potential for service, but I did. Yeah. I'm very curious, what did your family think about this? Uh, I think my family thought it couldn't happen, as, as most people did. And so when I mentioned it to them and I filled out the application, they reminded me that they had always taught us to think for ourselves and make decisions. But again, so they told me to do that when they thought it couldn't happen. Right. But when it did happen, they were extremely supportive. Very fine. Were they uh, able to be there the day you were uh, enlisted into the service? No. Uh, Strangely, I applied from South Carolina, but I went in from Columbus, Ohio, because the Army didn't answer me fast enough, and I went on back to graduate school. <laughs> and that's where they caught up and with And that's you. where they caught up with, with me, and that's where I went in. So I came in from the 5th Service Command. Now, exactly when was that in 1942? Uh, I was inducted into the service on July 13th, 1942. How did you get out to Fort Des Moines? Well, that was half of the Ohio contingent. The other half showed up on the July 18th, 1942, mm -hmm. and we were prepared to embark for Fort Des Moines right then and there. Fantastic. And so, and when they were inducted, the second half of the group, we all were marched, and that's where we learned how you marched. We were marched into a train. Into a train, there you sat. <laughs> there we <laughs> sat. <laughs> and uh, we came on to Des Moines then. So you came into Fort Des Moines and you were members of that first officer candidate mm -hmm. class. That's right. And tell us something about the training you had there, your officers, and if you remember the names of individuals that we could record here. Yes, uh, Colonel Don Faith was the commandant yes. of the first Wright Training Center at that particular time. When we all jumped out of those trucks at the back of, at Des Moines, at the back of those trucks, 
we were marched into a staging center, a reception center, I guess it was. We had to learn the terms. A reception center, and the first thing that took place was literally a shock to us. There had been 25 of us who had traveled together from uh, Columbus, Ohio, and uh, an officer came in and asked if the colored girls would move over to some seats he had way over in the corner. And then he proceeded to call the rest of them by name to send them to their quarters. And of course, we were sort of shocked that this kind of action would take right. place. When they call you by name, just call everybody by name. But we, we survived that, and we went to our separate quarters, number 54, at Fort Des Moines, Iowa, and that's where we had our basic training. Now, as for the training, it was all the same. And we, we were in the third platoon of the first company of the first training regiment, and we had exactly the same training. But was, we, it, was your training separate from the white women, or were you together? Sometimes, when it called for platoon size group, it was separate. But mm -hmm. when it was company size or in mass demonstrations of physical training out on the parade ground, we were all together. You were all together. Yes. Mm -hmm. How would you say the white women in the company, and I'm sure many of them were from the South, yes. so areas that were used yeah. to mm -hmm. segregation. Yeah. Yeah. How did they receive you as fellow well, officer candidates? Well, we all approached each other cautiously. Remember, segregation was on both sides. Absolutely. So we all approached each other cautiously. And I must say that although uh, we were in separate quarters, we knew the members of our class, we had our formations together, and only in, there was only one real incident all the time we were in officer training school. Remember, we're a select group, and I guess they hoped that some of the foolishness of that sort of stuff would stay out of it. So we only had one very bad incident, and after that was over, she was all right. <laughs> very, very, very good. Well, now, you graduated in August of 1942. 20, 29 August 1942. And were commissioned at that time third officer? Third officer, that's and right. And I understand you stayed at Fort Des Moines for quite I some time. I stayed at Fort Des Moines until January 1945. But I had lots of different assignments. Tell us about the different assignments you well, had there. Well, excuse me. I must tell you that the afternoon after we graduated, two things happened. Some of us moved into officers' quarters on officers' row out of the barracks. Right. That afternoon after we'd moved, we were interviewed. And I remember that, I don't remember what his face looked like, but the officer interviewed me, interviewed me, didn't look up. He asked, you Adams? Yes, sir. Do you want to recruit? Yes, sir. No, sir. I don't know what it is. <laughs> yes, sir. What do you want to do? I don't know, sir. He said, thank you. I don't know what I'm going to do with you young women. You're too young to be in the Army in the first place. That was on Saturday, and Monday morning I was made a company commander. Uh, as your very first <laughs> as assignment? My first on September the 1st, 1943, right. or September, no, on August the 30th, I guess, we were all discharged. And on September the 1st, those who chose to stay in the service were sworn into the, to the Army, to the Women's Army Corps. Very and we lost, I have since heard that we lost about a third of that first group, but I didn't think it was that large from my point of view, mm -hmm. you know, so because most of us were having gotten over the initial training, we were very pleased to be there. For the duration in six. For the duration in six. <laughs> well, I guess it was about 1945 that word began to spread that possibly you were going to go overseas. Could you tell us about this? Because this truly is so unique. Well, actually, the Wax had been going overseas for quite some time, and I, as I understand it, they were afraid that if they sent black Wax overseas, we would cause a problem. I never had found out what, quite what they meant by right. that. But eventually there was sufficient pressure from the press and so forth that they finally decided to go overseas. And that's when, as I told you, I had been put on orders to go to Command General Staff School. I know. And I was taking blitz courses so I could be as bright as those staff officers and field, field officers who were at Command and General Staff School. I was taken off those orders and given orders to go overseas after Colonel McCroskey, McCroskey I ascertained that I was willing to go as if I had any, that had anything to do with it. He just wanted me to go happy. <laughs> I would imagine at that time, although perhaps I'm wrong, that just the, the awareness of the fact that you were becoming truly a part of women's military history by being the first black commander of a black female battalion to go to Europe. You How did that hit you? Well, you don't really think history when you're doing something. No, you it's don't. not history until after you do it. Mm -hmm. So, actually, I understood that I had that several officers 
had wanted that assignment, but I had the most troop experience. So if you're going to send a, nearly a thousand people overseas, you want somebody who has troop experience. So it was almost a case of not having much choice. And I wanted, if we went, I wanted us to do a good, as good a job as I thought we had done at Fort Des Moines. And therefore, I was, uh, that's, that's how I thought about doing the job well. Although I didn't know what the job was, and I didn't know where I was going when I left the stage, I knew that, and this is a premise that I have used in, in the Army and any place else, given the same opportunity and training, I'm sure I can do as well as anybody else. Absolutely. Well, you knew it was the 6888? No, not then. I didn't know, didn't what, know it was. That then, no. what it was going to uh, be. Captain Noel Campbell and I were sent over a couple of weeks ahead mm -hmm. of the troops to get things ready for them, mm -hmm. and it wasn't until, and they sent us to, we thought we were going to Paris, and we opened our sealed orders one hour after we were in flight and found that we were going to London. And we went, we reported to the WAC staff director there, and uh, we found out that we were going to be in the postal directory service. And I went, I, well, we worked for a week with the postal service under the adjutant general's office. We paid all the respect calls you're supposed to pay, and uh, then we set out getting the place ready for our troops to come. And I knew I was the commanding officer because they told me I was, and also I was the senior officer and everybody else had been told I was off. I kept waiting for my orders from the War Department, right. which incidentally didn't arrive until after I got out of the service. But I, on May 1st, 1945, I issued General Order 1 for 6 AAA and declared myself as taking command. I had to have something to work with. Tremendous. The 6888 Central Postal, Postal Directory, Directory Battalion. Battalion. Okay. Here today, this is a picture of Charity Adams when she first arrived in, the, um, in Birmingham, England. And she's actually um, uh, saluting the commanding general of the communication zone at that time, General Lee. And this was in England in 1945. So, one thing I wanted to know is what was life like in Europe for members of the 6888? One of the things that came out, one of the things that came out um, many times during the e in interviews was that there was just so much, so much rubble. There was the ruins uh, of uh, war that they uh, lived with. And so they walk and see that, that is something that came out many, many times in the interviews. Um, there, job was to redirect mail and I have a photograph I didn't put it in the slide where you see the mail is just piled up to the roof lots and lots of mail um, and this is a picture of them actually redirecting uh, the mail or uh, preparing it to be redirected and they worked in shifts they also maintained their quarters now being a segregated unit, they were self-contained. They took care of their meals, they did their courses. Now they had to have medical um, uh, attention. There was a doctor that came in every now and then. But generally, they did everything uh, that was necessary for that battalion to run, all right, during that time. Um, here is a snack bar. 6888 snack bar. This is in Rouen, France. Here again is Charity Adams, and she is, um, uh, oh, you can see that clearly there, uh, being served a Coca-Cola by one of the members. Uh, there was a dance held by the 549th Engineer Company at France. So they socialized. This particular uh, company, the 549th, was an African-American uh, engineer company and there they're socializing, having a dance. The first African-American military couple was married in Rouen, France, and she was a member of the 6888 Central Postal Directory Battalion. They also socialized with Europeans. And one of the things that came out of um, so many of the interviews is that when they were overseas, they didn't feel discriminated against by Europeans that they weren't just 
uh, they didn't just meet in uh, pubs or uh, outside of homes. They met, they were invited to their homes and uh, they were treated. So here's Gladys Thomas uh, going skiing with some of uh, her friends. Uh, here visiting European home again, you find two members of the 6888 Postal uh, Battalion actually uh, being entertained. Uh, this is standing formation in the King Edward School, and that was where the unit was billeted uh, in England, in Birmingham, England. So in sum, the 6 Triple Eight was a controversial battalion. It resulted from socio-political campaigns to allow African-American whites to serve overseas. The members had a desire to meet their citizenship obligation through military service. It was also a cohesive unit. And I argued that the race and gender discrimination members of that unit experienced actually unified them. It gave them the determination to perform beyond expectation. And again, they were treated with respect and dignity. Another theme, all the women I interviewed say that they were treated with respect and dignity uh, by people in Birmingham, England, and by people in Rouen, France, uh, that Europeans did not discriminate against them, and that they interacted with Europeans socially. Now, I just want to make some concluding remarks by saying a little bit about the social outcomes of World War II. I stated about things before we went into the war and how uh, segregation was the, uh, actually the law of the land. Some people said, but just in the South, uh, African Americans were discriminated, discriminated against in the country. But there were some things that were changing. The reason why I say change, that were changing, and I say that World War II was a turning point, they were changing during World War II. During World War II, the War Department started to move towards racial. There are a couple of studies. 1944, the Army's Gillum Board assess the performance of black soldiers. And to make a long story short, they recommended greater opportunities for, for blacks in the military. Um, a, Scholar by the name of Stauffer, Samuel Stauffer, had volumes of studies that revealed that during World War II, one of the things that uh, they discovered as a result of these studies is that during World War II, the more contact white soldiers had with black soldiers, the more favorable was their reaction towards racial integration. So racial desegregation actually uh, occurs in the military in 1948. That's when President Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9981, officially desegregating the armed forces. Note that this predates the Brown versus Board of Education, the civilian society, uh, thus the military was at the forefront of racial desegregation leading towards integration. Things change for women as well. 1948, the Armed Services Integration Act provided a permanent status for women in the military. It placed a 2% limit on the representation of enlisted women and a 10% limit on the representation of women in the officer corps. So between 1941 and 1945, an estimated 400,000 women served in the military. Among them, were members of the 6888. Thank you. We'll now open for a question and answers. Comments? Does someone have a mic?
to make a comment. Uh -huh. yes, As you know, or maybe you know, I have a habit of you, I must know what I need to know. That's how I operate. operate. Well, you know that uh, Discovery Channel put out a movie not so long ago about where everybody came from. And the, the archaeologists said everybody came from China. That was changed about 20 years later. Everybody came from Africa. Let me repeat it. Everybody came from Africa. The DNA proves that. No matter where you are, what country you came, or color, all that, all people came from Africa. If you want to read the Wall Street Journal story on that, Google it. Wall Street Journal story on where everybody came from. Now, I guess, fast forward, fast backwards, we would not have had that problem, the NMI okay. if they had the facts as to where everybody came from. Well, I'm certainly they in a more humane way, I mean. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. The question is, what was the most surprising thing to me when I conducted this study? Well, the most surprising thing was that, um, and let me give you a little bit of background here, I was, um, uh, this is the 90s, all right, early 90s, 91, 95 junior faculty member and um, come across um, a person who served in the 6888 on a panel. I was a number cruncher, I guess I still am, and I'm giving survey data on contemporary issues concerning women in the military. And here's a woman next to me talking about experiences that she had during World War II and that she had to call Eleanor Roosevelt to get involved, and the more she talked, the more it sounded incredible to me, but you know, the more surprising was that I didn't know about it. That's when I realized that I had to uh, extend my research agenda and find out more about the history of African American women in the military. And lo and behold, everything she stated was verified. It came out, uh, Mary B McLeod Bethune was friends with um, Eleanor Roosevelt. And Eleanor Roosevelt was very instrumental in seeing to it that African American women were going to participate in the Women's Army Corps. And this is clearly seen by looking at letters. I went to the Bethune uh, Museum here in Washington, D.C., and you get lots of letters that they wrote. Then I also went down to Florida, Bethune Cookman. And there's, a, there's a, an archives there with letters. And uh, uh, shows that um, Eleanor Roosevelt actually visited her in the Bethune-Cookman home. So there was a relationship there that I never knew. That was surprising to me. The other thing, on another note, that surprised me, whenever I would call people up, like, for example, uh, Noel Campbell Mitchell at Tuskegee, Tuskegee Institute, and um, I said, well, I'd like to come down and, and interview you. And she says, fine. She says, well, tell me what time you're going to come there so that, be here so that I can pick you up at the airport. <laughs> I didn't expect to have someone come in, you know, she says, oh, I'm working, but I'll come pick you up at the airport. That was just so surprising to me. The, the vitality, you know, the amount of energy these folks had. And, um, so, and that was uh, a pleasant surprise, you know. And then I guess the extent of discrimination that these women faced and not letting it dampen their morale, not letting it 
demoralized them. They continued to work hard to show that they could be the best that they could be. And that was such an important lesson because a lot of times when you're trying to advance in a career, you just get a lot of doors closed in your face. And that happens. But they were a classic example, in the, the embodiment of the notion of um, not giving up, being steadfast, and continuing on. And I think that that was very important. Uh, it was surprising to me because the extent of the insult. And I showed you some examples, let's say, in terms of the racial, um, in some terms, apartheid here in America. Um, but the women in the unit, Gladys Carter talked about wanting to drink out of um, a, a, um, a fountain that wasn't marked colored, it was white only. And she was at Fort Oglethorpe, and she said she was determined the other women followed her. And that could have been led to something, but this determination to stand up for what they felt and what they knew was right. All of these things are lessons learned that I took away. Yes. Hi, how are you doing? Thank you for the Hi. information. Appreciate it. Um, what, what challenges do you see that were happening in 1942 and World War II that are paralleled today with the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan that women and African Americans are struggling with today? Can you tell me like some parallels and differences between how they were struggling and how they are now? Yeah, um, I think the big struggle that women and African Americans, and I would even say this goes beyond just African Americans, um, other uh, people that are considered othered in America, um, goes back to that core theme, and that core theme is citizenship. Citizenship rights. And so you find even today, I, just last week, I saw a, uh, a woman in the Navy who um, actually refused to stand and salute the flag, and the Navy Department's trying to figure out what to do with her. Well, it put me in mind of these women during World War II, you know, in the 6th AAA, that refused an order that was so demeaning. None of the other whacks were being, um, none of that dirty work was being reserved for the other whacks, and the commander coming out and blatantly saying, no, this is what you do, you know, and them standing up. Well, here, the, there are people, not only in the military, but he, she served in Afghanistan, um, taking a stand for this movement, Black Lives Matter. So again, this whole notion of citizenship is uh, a, a challenge for people, not only during the World War II era, but even today. And it extends beyond just black and white. Yes. What, what year were you in the WAC? We went in at the same time. I was in the 73, Fort McClellan, Alabama. McClellan, yes. yes. And I don't know if you remember at the time when I, I went in and uh, I experienced, I think, my first racial incident at Fort McClellan because we went down, you know, we were going to uniforms and all that, and went to get in a cab, and the cab driver was white and said to me, excuse my French, and said, Jack, well, you niggas can't sit in the front. And here we were in our uniforms. Let me just make a comment. I'm glad you mentioned that because of the fact that in my presentation I said that desegregation began in 1948. And although 
desegregation did take place, and then afterwards, you know, we've got the civil, uh, the uh, Brown v. Board of Education and the Civil Rights Movement, leading to um, the Civil Rights Act of 1964. These changes did, in fact, take place, and what they show is that no longer is it institutionally acceptable to discriminate. So that means that on a structural level, that desegregation has taken place. See, it was legal to segregate during World War II era. When you and I were at Fort McClellan, it wasn't legal to do that. So you find individuals still having a problem with uh, integration. Uh, and so here are two different periods. It seems like it's the same thing, but it's not. I mean, we had a racial ideology during World War II. We don't have that ideology, you know, but we do have some lingering um, uh, 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 sentiments of racial inequality. It doesn't reflect in law and policy the way it did during World War II. But I believe that we've got to remain vigilant because things can unravel and go backwards if you don't. And so I applaud people who stand up for the rights. And when I see someone saying, no, I'm standing up and I'm saying Black Lives Matter and this is why I'm saying, I think, you know, we're not past there. Something has to be done. And so when you look at history, people have been standing up all along. And now there's this uh, movie called uh, The Birth of a Nation, I think, and showing that there's a slave, you know, revolts. People have been standing up all along, not just passive recipients. So change isn't going to take place if you turn a blind eye. Thank you for that comment. Uh, do we have time for Yeah, we just have time for one more question. One more? So you had mentioned that unlike the African-American male units in World War II, the African-American female units had African-American female officers. Did the Army decide that training African-American men to be officers was more threatening than training the women? What was the concern there? Why the difference? I think part of the concern there, yeah, um, is that the women are going on after the men. It was already established, the racial policies are already established in, uh, by the War Department for the men. The women who are going on, and there's, a, there's an effort on the part of activists to say, no, they're going to be treated equally. And so there's more of that protest taking place with the women and uh, an oversight, you know, people overseeing and letters being written back and forth Whenever something would happen, there would be a letter. Bethune would go and visit the inst uh, installation. So there's this pressure from the outside to make sure that women are going to be part of this, or African-American women are going to be part of this first group of women officers that go in. Does that suggest that the women had more of a struggle ahead of them and therefore needed more political pressure? Or why, why didn't this happen? Uh, when, it, when it happened, so it's yeah, why did it happen early. when it happened uh, is, is a very, very good question. Um, I know that, <laughs> it's a very good question because I hadn't thought about it quite that way, you know, that time. I know that um, certainly there were the activists that said, now women are going in, and if women are going in, and, and Mary McLeod the food was at the forefront of that, you know, and why it happened so much then, and not before, that type of pressure before, um, I can't answer. Okay. Oh, that's the last one. That's it. So I'd like to say that on behalf of the National Postal Museum, thank you for this very illuminating discussion. And for those of you who are interested in buying her book after the uh, lecture, please go downstairs and join us in the book signing ceremony. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>